Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, I have two of my students who can take microphones to people who ever want to talk. So, um, yeah, Ryan and Ann, you could go to the back there and get the microphone. <coughs> So, um, good. So given, so given that the DOJ can impose um, individual liability on executives, um, from a student's perspective, please help me understand if the CLO and the CCO role should be separated, and if so, what function should they manage? Or do you think um, a CLO, the chief legal officer, can do all of the roles without any conflict of interest to, in building an effective compliance culture? So I hope others on the panel who may uh, be closer to that issue than I am will also comment. But uh, there's, if you read Ben Heidemann's book, he describes the very long convoluted debate that's going on about whether certain positions should be combined or, combined or separated, whether who should report to whom, and all like that. And he says it really doesn't matter. Uh, what he says is uh, what is critical is that everyone who has any role of importance in the uh, monitoring of a uh, company's conduct and the detecting of its uh, 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 misconduct coordinate on a daily basis uh, and be uh, and secondly that they be given total and complete support by the CEO and he thinks those two things are much more important than any of the um, niceties of who's combined who's separate who's um, uh, uh, reporting to whom and so forth so I just mentioned that as, as at least his perspective. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> um, so you you spoke a lot about what you suggest be done differently, and maybe the. Justice Department or with the regulatory agencies, what are your suggestions for compliance and legal professionals working in-house in businesses now? Well, as I mentioned, the responsibility or monitoring what goes on in a company has to a very large extent passed inside in a way it wasn't true 50 years ago. Um, so it is uh, the inside chief legal officer who really uh, makes the tough legal decisions, not the outside lawyer. It is the inside uh, uh, either chief financial officer or a top accounting person who makes the tough uh, accounting standard uh, determinations, not the outside auditors. This is a, a significant change, uh, but there, there's no turning it back in my view. Um, so what those folks lack is the same independence that the outsiders have um, because they are, when all said and done, employees who are um, dependent on uh, management uh, for their very jobs, let alone um, their pay and other uh, uh, aspects. So the question is how to uh, provide inside at least a modicum of increased independence um, to replace the lost um, uh, independence from the outside professionals. And I think um, uh, there may not be any way to do it entirely, uh, but part of it is uh, having uh, uh, them 
their uh, bosses really be the independent directors of the board rather than management. Independent members of the board setting their pay, setting their tenure, setting all that. Independent members of the board being the people they report to um, uh, on any matter of, of importance. Um, uh, the, um, now that would not sit well with uh, many managers who say that's no way to run a company. We, we need to, the managers have to manage and, and that includes every function, but it, I'm suggesting that uh, it nevertheless would provide a certain amount of independence for the people who are, whose roles are those of quasi-professionals um, and who need to have an independence in order to exercise the professional part of their duty. Uh, there are other things I'm sure that could be done. Uh, 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 a, um, uh, I keep coming back to Ben Heinemann, so I'll tell you why. Um, General Electric has always been an a, a important uh, uh, company. In the 1950s, no one here was alive then, but I was, uh, uh, their uh, GE executives were the first to ever go to prison for antitrust violations. And it was big headlines. I remember it as a, a young boy growing up. Um, and that was uh, a, if you will, a wake-up call for GE, uh, which had prided itself on its law-abiding corporate culture. And there it was its own top level people going to prison. Um, and um, so they turned things around and one of the things that they did, although it wasn't until a decade or so later, was to bring in uh, uh, Ben Heinemann as general counsel. Ben Heinemann had been a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he was number one in his class at uh, Yale Law School, though you know that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, he, w he was uh, a terrific and very smart person. Ben Heinemann created the first <coughs> large in-house counsel uh, program of any major corporation. He grew it in the uh, 25 years that he was there. He grew G's in-house uh, lawyers from 40 to 500. Huge increase. Um, but he insisted at all times that he be given a role in any decision of the corporation, including business decisions that could in any way uh, present uh, legal issues. So he played a role very similar to what an outside counsel used to play. And Jack Welsh, the CEO, uh, who, who was uh, devoted to Ben Heinemann, encouraged him to play that role and brought him in formally or informally on every major decision made. And the result was that GE never faced this kind of scandal it had faced in, in the 50s. So it can be done. A lot of it is in the attitude of the CEO, but I also think even when the CEO is not willing to play that kind of role, there are ways to design around that, such as what I suggested. Judge, uh, fair disclosure, I'm, I've been an in-house counsel for over 30 years, so I, I, um, the, I understand your point about the buildup within companies of, of large compliance staffs and lawyers, in-house lawyers. I also, I also understand the, the point about independence, but I guess another point, a counterpoint would be that um, another trend is for um, in-house departments to, to create a better compliance culture within a company. You know, they know the clients, they know the, the, the people within, they can train them, and they can create this compliance culture that ultimately will lead to good decisions. They'll, they'll be able to detect um, misconduct um, even before it happens, and, you know, that, that there'll be this great, greater communication piece. So there's, there is a really a strong role for, for in-house counsel in, in, this, in this kind of piece. So I don't mean to be misunderstood in that I think I'm all for enhanced compliance, uh, but uh, what I'm more skeptical of is what it can be, what it can do alone. 
And I'm also skeptical of how much of it can be imposed from um, the government. The, the, um, you know, we're, we're talking about corporate culture, and as I mentioned before, I think that's a, a term a lot of people have had trouble defining. Um, but presumably it at least means uh, creating uh, uh, norms of behavior that everyone in the company from the janitor on up feels is part of what this company is all about. And I think um, it's very hard to impose that from outside. And so where compliance programs have been imposed from outside and are viewed by even the insiders as something imposed, they become checklists. Oh yeah, we know we gotta uh, satisfy the checklist that this compliance officer uh, has foisted upon it, but it doesn't create uh, norms. There's an old saying which you may have heard that um, three pages of principles of ethical principles fully supported uh, at all times by the CEO are worth them more than 30 pages of rules imposed from outside. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so um, uh, I, I am not at all impo uh, opposed to um, increased in compliance programs on the part of companies. I'm just skeptical of how much can be done by the government in changing corporate culture through imposed compliance programs from outside. Um, has the Dodds-Frank legislation or any federal statute restored any of the protections or restrictions that existed under Glass-Steagall? Well, I'd be very interested in hearing the, the, the SEC's view uh, on that. Um, uh, the, the, we can have a long debate over Glass-Steagall. My own view is it was a big mistake to repeal it. Um, but uh, whether that uh, is true or not, um, uh, certainly Dodd-Frank was intended to restore some of, in a, in a more sophisticated way, some of the problems that had arisen since the repeal uh, of Glass-Steagall. Um, you know, Dodd-Frank was a huge burden to the SEC. They were suddenly told, you know, write these umpteen, you know, hundreds, thousands of regulations, and they're still in the process to some extent. Uh, and now uh, it may be that some of that will be undone in, in the current political situation. Um, so uh, I think it's too soon to, to really evaluate uh, Dodd-Frank, but I think there are others here who probably have a more uh, nuanced view of that than I do. So one more question, and then we'll turn to the panel. I've exhausted you, so if you there's one over there. Yeah. Okay, you uh, mentioned that um, there were um, some um, that there was a difference between um, the. Um, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Okay, okay. Pardon me if I'm not um, articulating myself very well. <laughs> There, you mentioned that um, there were, there was a difference um, when when it came to um, enhanced compliance, whether um, the um, com whether um, the CEOs saw it as like just like congruent with with their own um, corporate culture, and then others that found it too burdensome. Did you um, notice any patterns, um, like what particular um, things were um, seen as too burdensome, or? Well, the, the, um, I do commend to you, this is not a, a direct answer, but I do commend to you uh, uh, Brandon Garrett's book, uh, Too Big to Jail, which, as I say, does an exhaustive summary uh, of all the deferred prosecution and, and corporate prosecutions, even if not deferred, uh, from 2000 to 2014. And it took him many years because of one unfortunate thing about uh, 
uh, deferred prosecutions and even something called bond prosecution agreements, which also exist, is there's very little of the public record about them. So you don't know how they work out. For example, when a deferred prosecution agreement comes before a federal judge, he or she has to sign off on it at the beginning with a lot, a lot of deference to the parties, as I am well aware. Uh, but, uh, the, um, uh, uh, but the judge does not see what happens thereafter, except in very unusual circumstances. So a, uh, you, will, uh, you will sign off, if you're a judge, on a deferred prosecution that says, um, the following uh, 25 uh, new forms of compliance will be put in place, and the company will pay for them, and, will, and sometimes there's a monitor and sometimes there's not, but in either case, they will report directly or indirectly to the Department of Justice. But if something goes wrong, what happens? Usually, the Department of Justice works it out with the company. The judge doesn't see that. It's only in the rarest circumstances that the violation of the agreement is so egregious that the parties come back to the court and say, take action. So it's very hard for me to know what works and doesn't work in that sense because I don't see the end result. What Brandon Garrett says is um, that it uh, uh, doesn't work uh, in many, many, many cases, because as shown by the high degree of recidivism. Um, he recommends, among other things, uh, having more hands-on involvement by the judge. Um, I think that's a splendid suggestion, but I say that with some trepidation because my colleagues will say, oh my God, more work? What the hell do you want? Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that might be a, a good way. But other than that, it's hard for me to, to respond to your question. 